Good morning. Welcome to This Week in South Florida. I'm Michael Putney. I'm Glenna Milberg. This holiday weekend begins with changes from little tweaks to <laughs> seismic turns. The switch flipped on almost 150 new state laws Friday. All products of the recent legislative session, one of the most contentious in state history, and an unprecedented $109 billion state budget. Some of those consequential new laws went into effect on Friday. They touch almost every Florida citizen in one way or another. Two South Florida lawmakers in the middle of it all right here with us today. State Senator Chevron Jones, Democrat repping South Broward and Northern Miami-Dade, and State Representative Chip LaMarca, Republican from Fort Lauderdale. Great to see you both, and thanks so much for being with us on this holiday weekend. Yeah, and we're going to use first Thank names you know. because we know you both well. Chevron Jones and Chip LaMarca, Chip and Chev. Uh, so, uh, Chip LaMarca, let me begin with you. Uh, your party is in the majority in Tallahassee with a big leader in Governor Ron DeSantis. How would you give a grade to this session of the legislature in terms of what it did for the people of Florida? How, how, how did you do? Well, you know, I, I would give it, I would say an A. Uh, and the reason is, is uh, perception versus reality. We passed uh, a significant amount of bills, the vast majority being bipartisan, many of them being unanimous. Uh, we had a few bills that were obviously uh, in the in the in the headlines, but the reality is we funded affordable housing, we funded uh, water, uh, Everglades restoration, things like that that are really important. Uh, we raise the minimum wage of of every state worker. Uh, there are a lot of great things that passed, but uh, you know, you guys do a great job of getting the message out. Not all do. Uh, okay, we will take that and and sort of I'm going to run with that thought because the ones you're right that made the headlines were the big. Um, consequential to many people and the most contentious and a lot of people calling them the culture war bill. So Chevron Jones, um, I'm going to guess you have as a member of the minority a little bit of a different perspective in that the Democrats really didn't get their way in Tallahassee. Take that. Run with it. <laughs> well, the, the one thing I, I can I can say uh, that my friend Chip says that we, we there were quite a few bills that we did work together on. Uh, I wouldn't say that this legislative session that was actually an A, you know, especially when you are infringing on the rights of people, uh, whether it's LGBTQ people, or whether it's uh, uh, trying to uh, whitewash Black history and which the state of Florida is trying to do. Uh, you can't get an A with uh, with those type of laws. Uh, I think we did pass a record-breaking budget with the help from the federal government, who give who gave a, a quite a few dollars uh, that we were able to uh, give to cities uh, to help with the bounce back from from COVID. Uh, but when you're uh, when you're filing bills like parental rights and education, which we have uh, colloquially called the "Don't Say Gay" bill uh, or the "Stop the Woke Act," uh, that is that you're trying to alter how you teach Black history inside of our classroom. Um, those are infringing on the truth and also on the rights of people. Uh, and I believe that the state of Florida, if there are areas, the areas that we work bipartisan on, uh, we should be able to work bipartisan on some of these other issues, some of the social issues that we dealt with in this last legislative session. Yeah, Chev, you have uh, mentioned a lot of bills, a lot of areas we will get down, as Glenna would say, we will drill down into, but let's begin with the so-called don't say gay bill, the parental rights and education. Just to put it on the table here, you are proudly an openly gay man. Do you think that that bill is um, uh, anti-gay? Well, I mean, we, with, with you, what, let's be clear. And I said this yesterday and I'll, I'll keep saying it. Uh, as a former educator, uh, there is no school nowhere in the state of Florida or within the country that teaches children in primary grades about sexual orientation and gender identity. No school, nowhere. Don't say gay as it came to be known was never about parental rights. It has always been about control. And Governor DeSantis is, is clearly he's looking to uh, move into higher office. And so he pitched these culture wars uh, over this last legislative session, starting with um, a stop the woke at and continuing uh, with uh, the parental rights and education. Parents already have rights, but you you create a, a title 
to make people think that it's about parental rights, but your rights are already protected based off the U.S. Constitution and the Florida Constitution. So, so maybe, yes, it was an attack on the legislature, on the LGBTQ community. So I, I know just from being in, in Tallahassee and watching the debate, I thought it would be really important for people and sides to hear each other, and, and you were so passionate about that, and I wonder if your colleagues across the aisle heard what you were saying, even though the Parents' Rights in Education Act actually does have a lot, of, enumerate a lot of parental rights in education, it really does. Chip, you, um, there were seven Republican members of the House and Senate that voted against this, uh, kind of against the party, most of those seven are representatives and senators from South Florida, you being one of those. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I would love to hear your perspective on that because, you know, that, that must have been a really tough vote for you. You know, that bill, uh, look, I, I, I'm sent there as a, a Republican from Broward County is at this point right now the last one. Um, and to have a voice in Tallahassee at the same time, uh, I have to vote independently sometimes. And I, I didn't feel a need for the bill uh, after hearing so many hearings, uh, different, I, I was in a lot of the committees that it, that it went through. And after hearing from so many folks locally, I just didn't find a need for the actual bill. There was a lot of good, as you'd mentioned, Glenna, and, and you're one of the, one of the people that keeps saying to folks, did you read the bill? Do you know what's in the bill? And Chev was, was, um, my friend here was, was very, uh, eloquent in saying, uh, that there was a lot of other things in the bill and explaining, explaining that, um, you know, it, it, look, I vote, some of the votes are difficult, but at the end of the day, I serve the, the population of district now 100, Coastal Broward County. And, you know, I'm not in Lake County or some other place in the state of Florida. I, I get a hundred from the American Conservative Union. I get a hundred from the, the chamber that, you know, handle, you know, that handles a lot of the business issues that are important to me and our community. Uh, but when I get pushed too far on, on an issue, I'm going to hold my ground. Yeah. Uh, Chef Jones, uh, we have seen reports coming out of central Florida where at least one school district, we are told, has uh, told teachers they have to take down any pictures in their classroom of a same-sex spouse or any kind of a gay pride uh, poster or a rainbow uh, signifying gay rights. Uh, that seems, uh, seems very unlikely for the district in South Florida, but teachers, gay teachers, told our reporters this week from at Local 10 that they are confused. I mean, they don't know what they should do to comply with the law. What do you say? Well, I think that the, the vagueness of the bill was a lot of the issue that even some of the Republicans on the Senate side have. And to my friend Chip Lamarco's credit, uh, he did vote against the, uh, the parental rights and education bill. So did some Republicans uh, in, in, uh, in the Senate because of the vagueness and because what, of what's happening right now. When you look at Orange County, you look at what's happening uh, in some other part, portions of the state, uh, the teachers are confused. Uh, but many of the Republicans, that's what they wanted this to be. They wanted this to be this type of uh, this confusion with the districts and with the school teachers. But imagine going to work and being told that you cannot have a picture of your significant other on your desk. Or even be, imagine being a, a child or a student who, who's trying to find someone in a safe space, but teachers can no longer have safe spaces in their classroom. And so it's the vagueness and it's the, and how the bill was written that many people are like, this is not needed. And it's still not needed to this day. That's why I'm happy it's being challenged in the courts. Another bill that's being challenged in the courts right now is the abortion restrictions that went into effect on Friday. And in fact, uh, there, there is an opinion now from Judge Cooper that it is unconstitutional because of Florida's constitutional right to privacy. Uh, that will no doubt be appealed by the state. Chip, um, in, this was another one of those. The debate was so passionate on both sides. The abortion bill is, if you read the bill, a bit bigger than abortion restrictions there is. It's actually called fetal and infant mortality reduction. And there are a lot of components and funding for just those programs. Um, I guess my question to you is, the, the practical effects of this, 96% of Florida's abortion take place bef before the first 15 weeks anyway, which is now um, maybe will be, depending on the courts uh, in effect. So d what, what do you hear as someone from South Florida, a fairly, uh, a place where most people by the polls are in favor of legal abortion rights, if not abortion itself, um, that take, take this, new law and what do you tell your constituents about this 
Well, I tell them what I've, what I've always said uh, with respect to how this law came down and then how the Supreme Court uh, ruled, it's pushing it back to the states. And the state of Florida is not Alabama, Mississippi, or Georgia. The state of Florida has access up to 15 weeks. The state of Florida is not eliminating abortion th through this legislation. The state of Florida understands that it must be safe and it must be legal, but it also must be very rare and exceptional. And, and you know, obviously, life is precious. We need to make sure that that uh, that you know every opportunity for that that person without a voice is is put out there. That said, again, the state of Florida has parameters up to 15 weeks. And Glennie, you point out that 96 percent of abortions in the state of Florida happen before that 15 week period. So, uh, you know, I, I think this came down as for me anyway, uh, about as far as as I can support. Uh, I am very pro-life, but at the same time, I want folks to have access. I understand there are extenuating circumstances. It was brought up many, many times, I think, from a political nature that there aren't exceptions for rape or incest. The exceptions are up to 15 weeks for anything or any reason. That being said, if the life of the mother, and, and I was raised by a single mother, the life of the mother to me is paramount. And if, if there is anything that can challenge that, uh, the, the health of that mother or the life of that mother, you know, that's the exception that we have in the state of Florida. And that's when I'm going to make sure that uh, the, mother's, uh, the mother's health always comes first. And, and real quick, because well, we have a, a break to get to you really quickly. Uh, I think the fear that we're hearing is that Florida will look to go further and maybe become one of the states that bans abortion outright. Have you heard any of that from your party? No, no. And I would, I, I would push back and explain that we're, we're Florida for a reason. We're not, you're not Mississippi, Alabama, or Georgia, and I, I hate to pick on them, but you know, we are Florida. We've, we, we have a, a, almost a thousand people moving here a day from Northern states. And I think they understand they're moving here because we are Florida, not because of uh, the weather. They're moving here because of what we're doing here. And I want to make sure that, that we're very independent from other states. All right, we are talking about what happened in the state legislature this session and the roughly 150 laws now on the books with Chevron Jones and Chip LaMarca. Stay with us. We'll be right back. On this Sunday, we are speaking live with State Representative Chip LaMarca of Lighthouse Point. Still believe you live in Lighthouse Point, Chip. And with yes, sir. State Senator Chevron Jones, who last I checked lived in West Park. So thank you both for being with us. Let's talk about one other important, or well, there were several, but one other very important bill passed by the legislature, HB 7, the so-called Anti-Woke Act. Uh, Chevron Jones, there were a number of members, especially the Democratic Party and black uh, lawmakers like you, who objected to this bill because, among other things, it's going to sort of rein in the way race is taught, the history of racial history uh, is taught in the schools. Is that your primary objection with this? Yeah, um, uh, yes, that's one of the objections. And I also I believe that it's a slippery slope when we start getting into uh, this, this conversation and trying to alter how you teach history. Uh, to even taking a step for further, the Department of Education just started training teachers not too long ago using Hillsdale's College, which is a private Christian college, uh, to be able to teach, uh, train the teachers and how they should teach civic education, um, saying that slavery wasn't that bad. Uh, or making it, uh, or making it clear uh, to uh, to to students that how they uh, how they learn slavery they should use a different type of terminology involuntary relocation uh, slavery is slavery in, lynching in is lynching red line sorry, is red line involuntary relocation I mean, involuntary relocation that's a that's a right. terrible euphemism. I guess it's a terrible euphemism of a word, but I mean, when we're trying to alter how you're teaching Black history because of you don't want a child to feel uncomfortable, uh, teach history. American history is American history. We came through a very dark time, and because we come through that dark time, does not mean that you omit or not teach it. Teach children the truth. So, um, okay, let's stay stay with that bill. And I know that you all called it the Stop Woke Act. And just like Don't Say Gay, that was kind of the sell uh, by opponents. But what the bill is called is individual freedom. I'm not quite sure I understand how that name is on that bill. Chip, maybe you can explain mm -hmm. that. But um, let me just throw out there that Miami-Dade superintendent will be our guest coming up. And, and we're going to hear how all of these changes might be implemented in the curriculum. But that aside, so the individual freedom, there is some vague wording in it. You, you see where it's going. 
Um, but it also covers um, businesses and corporations mm -hmm. in their training. And so, Chip, my question to you is, for, for this legislature, this conservative legislature that really wants hands off of businesses and take regulations away and let businesses be free to do what they will, th this is kind of um, an, an eyebrow raiser to, to put that kind of, you know, school, public schools are public schools, private corporations, should they be mandated to train a certain way? I, I, look, I, I certainly don't think so. And I, I want to take a little exception with, with my friend uh, Sheb's uh, explanation of the bill. It's my, my big issue and why I supported the bill was, and first of all, let me just say, I'm a Republican for one reason. I'm a Republican for this very issue because of Abraham Lincoln and what he did and, and, and where things were at the time. Uh, now, on the bill, the, the, the basis of what's being taught, it shouldn't be that there is an oppressor and, a, and an oppressed. It should be flat out history. As, as Shev said, we should learn history. It was not good. We understand how bad uh, this was for our country. We also understand where we are today. And so for me, it, it's, it's not to create a, a narrative where someone should feel like they did something wrong when they are five, six generations away from a, a terrible time in our country's history uh, versus uh, versus the person that should uh, should feel oppressed. I think it does. It does. It goes a long way to hurt both of their futures and who, who they think they are. Now, as far as companies, uh, no, I certainly don't think companies should be teaching things like this. And we're watching it on, on uh, you know, real time today that, you know, whatever happens on a uh, culture war level, the next thing that happens is you find companies that are, that are going to enable uh, the culture war. And we're seeing it with, uh, with, with the change in Roe v. Wade, for example. Um, again, Florida, Florida's, uh, Florida's unique place, but, uh, the idea that it got, that a company would just keep trying to go around, uh, the basis of, of laws and, and play the culture wars. You know, I don't like what happened in central Florida with Disney, but the reality is, you know, they should have, they should have engaged me and Chev and everybody else during the process when we were actually legislating these bills. Yeah. Well, since you have mentioned Disney, let's move on to that because that is really a big topic. Disney, of course, mm -hmm. is kind of a iconic company in Florida since 1967 when they were created uh, and, and lured to the state of Florida by the state saying you can have your own self-governing uh, district. It's called the Reedy Creek Improvement District. And Chevron Jones, uh, the legislature, did away with the Reedy Creek Improvement District because the CEO of Disney criticized the don't say gay bill and said it should be rescinded. What is your opinion on that? Disney World is the one of the largest, is the largest employer of Floridians in the state of Florida. Uh, and the fact that the, the governor uh, and my Republican colleagues went after Disney uh, because they just did not follow behind what they were doing when it came to the parental rights and education bill. Uh, all that does is begin to put fear in other private build, uh, businesses, uh, because if you do it to Disney, then the, who's next? Just because they don't want to go along with the given the, uh, the get along. Uh, but even to take it a step further, um, it, it, I think the biggest argument was who pays who pays the the dues or the fees um, that Reedy Creek currently have. Does that get taxed onto the people? Uh, but let's be clear, when we got to Tallahassee, uh, a lot of this was just a farce because at the end of the day, none of this can happen without the approval of the people. It was a messaging to uh, for the governor to, for across the state of Florida. You just can't dissolve a district uh, that has debts uh, because that debt will be have to be paid uh, by the people. And I know the state said that they would pay the debts, but it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. Uh, but we should not be in the business of, be, of being fear, of fear mongering people because they're not following what we say do uh, and it doesn't align with what they uh what their company uh, values are so in the short time we have left let me just pose this last question to you chip um fear mongering division you and chevron jones are good friends and you're so collegial and the two of you really not only talk but listen to each other so in this time of division you being the member of the florida majority <laughs> party how do you role model this? How do you take this mm -hmm. tenor forward and take to Tallahassee in the Capitol a more collegial, cooperative compromise where people are listening to each other instead of just talking at each other? Yeah, great question. Well, I, uh, Glenna, thank you. And, and uh, you're right, Chev and I are friends. We're in Leadership Florida together. We've, we've, we've stayed in contact and then became colleagues in the House and now he's in the Senate. 
guess what? When I when I couldn't get any, uh, a member of the Senate uh, in the Broward delegation, for example, or my own or the district senator to help me uh, pass a, a, a appropriation for the town of Lauder by the Sea, I went to Chev and Chev Chev ran it with me. And now there's going to be a drainage project down in Lauder by the Sea. By the way, he doesn't have any of uh, Lauder by the Sea or really any uh, territory anywhere close there. But he did it uh, with me because we're friends. Um, I think what's missing right now is the ability and 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 tr trust me, I understand how how uh, important and how emotional some of these issues are, for example, directly for Chev or for members of the minority in the House or the Senate. Uh, what I would ask everyone to do, and, they, and I have some that are, you know, that affect me as well. I, I have one ask for everybody on both sides, and that's if we can get, pa we have a t tough conversation about a specific issue that's turned into a culture war. Let's try to get past that right or wrong. Let's try to get past that and get to the next issue. I would like to go back to, you know, the days of Ronald Reagan, where we tried to work out the 75 or 80 percent we had in common, because as I mentioned to you before, 96 percent or 98 percent of the bills passed with support from both sides. We need to get to the point where we're, we're taking up those bills and not what's going to, you know, cause this time on TV and cause the controversy in the newspapers um, and, and, and try to work together. And I, I look at my doors always open for members that want to work on issues. I worked with uh, a representative Omfroy on a sports wagering bill. I worked with uh, then representative minority leader yeah. uh, Keone McGee on the uh, collegiate athlete name, image and likeness yeah. bill. And, you know, yeah. we passed it. We, we know that uh, you have been collegial, Chevron Jones, your friends and colleagues and amen to that. And amen to that. All right, gentlemen, thanks very much. Happy Fourth of July. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right, still to come, the Miami-Dade School Superintendent. A man at the helm as school districts face big changes to meet those new state laws. That's next. The year-end grades are out now for students in Miami-Dade and Broward, and it's one of those good news, bad news situations for the first test results and students went back to the classroom full time. From COVID slide to those significant new laws affecting students and education, South Florida school districts scrambling to make whatever change may be necessary in advance of the new school year next month. Dr. Jose Dotris took the helm of Miami-Dade's public school district in February, just as the legislature began debating the bills that would become those new laws. Dr. Dotris, great to have you aboard this morning. Welcome, sir. Great to see you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Happy and, Sunday. Thank you. And I know you were in Tallahassee doing a little lobbying on your own. Um, just a kind of a big, broad question to start. I'm not sure if you were able to hear our conversation with the two South Florida lawmakers. We talked a little bit about the specific education bills coming well, now in effect for new school year. Uh, how to teach racial history, how to teach sexual identity and gender identity. What kind of curriculum changes now does the district have to make, if any, to to meet that mandate? So, kind of very good, very good question. First of all, um, right now, some of those um, issues that are surging, I have to be very clear with you. Uh, we don't have uh, some of these uh, issues really pertaining to us as it relates to curriculum. For example, one of the mandates is the sexual orientation or gender, gender identity in grades K to three. We don't have that. We do not have that in the curriculum. I think we've been very clear. So that is one area that um, our school district um, really does not have to respond to uh, because um, we don't have it as part of our curriculum. Uh, it is not part of our uh, instruction. And so therefore, uh, the training that we provide to teachers is in, in different areas. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Dutris, we know that state, former state Senator Manny Diaz of Hialeah is now the state education commissioner. Uh, they are, his department is supposed to issue guidelines with specific recommendations about how these new laws, particularly this one, uh, are implemented. Uh, have you gotten those guidelines yet? Sure, um, Michael, we have. In fact, the commissioner sent uh, some communication to us, I believe, uh, around mid-June, uh, providing some guidance in terms of a lot of the uh, items surrounding the notification to parents. Um, and in addition to that, the clarification again about the, about the K-3 uh, curriculum and instruction 
as it relates to sexual orientation yeah. and gender can identity. I, you know, Jose, can I just in interrupt you for a minute? As I understand it, not in Miami-Dade, not in Broward, and nowhere in Florida was there any kind of curriculum where in K through three teachers were teaching about sexual orientation or gender, were they? I mean, this was not something that was going on. So I would venture to say yes. However, I am the superintendent of Miami-Dade County Public Schools, Michael, and I can assure you and attest to that in, in our district. Okay, so there's other portions of that bill though, because it goes on to say, must be taught in an age appropriate mm -hmm. way in the higher grades. It, age appropriate in some other terms may be considered vague and, and there might be in the, the guidance you got from the state, a, a more concrete and practical way to do that. And, and so, you know, we haven't seen that. But my question is, there's what we've been hearing actually from teachers and educators is this kind of chilling effect because they're not sure whether they don't they don't want to take a chance to say something wrong because in this bill it gives parents eventually the right to sue the district. So mm -hmm. do you see a hesitancy or a chilling effect that this might have or are you confident that there's going to be some really clear guidelines? So I, I always have to, we as a school district, we have to be very supportive of our teachers. That's critical in our ability to move forward and really help our students. And if you look at the results of our school districts, they, of our school district thus far, they're phenomenal, right? In terms of the amount of growth that we've done in order to recover much of the learning that has occurred. We will provide very clear guidance to our teachers in fact, this summer, we have school teams coming on board where we have major professional development. And we are currently in the process of interpreting the guidance that Michael was referring to and making sure that our teachers are clear and they're comfortable and there uh, is very little um, ambiguity in terms of what they will uh, be able to instruct and uh, appropriate guidelines uh, per se. Yeah. Uh, at this point, uh, we do have a team at the school district that's being careful uh, to analyze all the guidance that we're receiving. And as it pertains to age appropriate, I believe and I'm comfortable that we will provide the necessary clarity so that teachers are confident and they're comfortable. And if there are any questions, they know who to relate to, who yeah. to go to, whether it's their principals, or even the district. We all have to be together in making sure that we're clear, that we're supportive, and that we're moving forward and, and really creating uh, an environment that really provides for excellent education and is curriculum and instruction that is clearly grounded on state standards. Yeah, well, let me ask you the question that I had asked earlier to the two state lawmakers, which is a Central Florida school district has told apparently its teachers, don't got to take away any photographs of your spouse if you are in a same-sex marriage or relationship. And you got to take down any signs, a rainbow flag, uh, anything pride, posters. What about Miami-Dade? Are you telling your gay teachers or any teachers who support the gay movement to remove those items? Michael, we're not doing that. Um, I cannot speak for, for Orange County. Um, you know, we're in the process again of clarifying any guidance points and in our conversations with the legal department, that's part of the team. Uh, at this point, um, we don't believe, we're not doing that. And I don't believe, or I, I do not see references that, uh, of that on the bill. Yeah, yeah, well, good. When we come back, uh, school grades uh, have just come out. Not only that, a new state law eliminates the dreaded FSA, and we want to talk about that when we come right back. Stay tuned. We are back with Miami-Dade School Superintendent Jose Dotris in advance of the upcoming school year, if you can believe it already, not even July 4th, and we're talking about the school year. Um, Dr. Dotris, the uh, dreaded FSA, Florida Standard Assessment, that high-stakes test that third graders lose sleep over, that's going away under these new state laws, and instead there'll be 
testing periodically throughout the years. We understand it as progress monitoring is what they've called it, which seems in the headlines as a much better idea to assess students' assessment. But, you know, what do we know? What do you think? <laughs> Well, what I think is we've had multiple conversations with the DOE and with the Commissioner of Education. I have to tell you, Glenna, as an educator myself, I believe strongly in formative assessments. And formative assessments are assessments that deal with progress monitoring. Why are they so important? They, will, they should provide uh, immediate uh, ability to a teacher to correct or realign their instruction. It's like real-time information for teaching and learning. We've been relying for too long on summative assessments, results at the end of the school year. And so what do you do then? Um, I wanna be very optimistic that these um, more frequent, maybe these two or three um, formative assessments or progress monitoring assessment pieces that will be introduced will be shorter in length and they will be able to uh, really inform instruction for adjustments. Yeah. And I have to tell you again, if you look at the results of our school district currently, um, it's really remarkable what the teachers and the school leaders and through the guidance of our and leadership of our school board, you know, uh, the district has been able to um, out of 22 assessed items or categories, our school district has been able to outperform the state on 18 of these 21. And so our trajectory of continuous improvement is one that is showing results. And that of course is because of all these added efforts by teachers and school leaders when it comes from extended learning, after school, Saturday academies, they even participated and worked during the winter, um, spring break, winter break, spring break. So I, we're just very, very encouraged that some of the unfinished uh, learning and the academic recovery, we're seeing the results of the incredible effort of so many people across our school district. And, and we have to welcome, learn, and be able to really understand what the uh, state assessment will be replaced with. So we still are waiting for additional information and guidance and kind of gearing up for these new assessments that again, will be more frequent in nature and hopefully uh, empower teachers to be able to respond to learning in a quicker way. Yeah. Um, Dr. Dutras, uh, just this morning before the, this conversation, I reviewed the results from the FSA from Miami-Dade and Broward, and you're right. The results overall show improvement. I'll give you just one. 59% of Miami-Dade elementary students earned a grade of three, I guess a C or better in English, English language skills, and that is a 3% increase over how they scored last year. But here's my question. So you've got 59% of, of these students uh, in elementary schools doing well on their English language skills. Uh, what about the 41% the you know, who are not testing at grade level? What are you doing for them? Sure, Michael, and that is really, you know, just because we're showing growth and the effort has been there, that does not mean that we have to do more. Absolutely, and what this is indicating is that we need to get to more students. One of the things that we're noticing in the data is that in the area of reading and language arts, especially for our youngest students, we have to do more interventions and really pay more attention to our youngest students. Again, the, the, what we all know is that they get to third grade and they're not proficient in reading, yeah. they will continue to uh, delay. That's one of the major pieces of interest or focuses that we will have on reading instruction, mathematics, especially for the early grades. So just because we've improved does not mean that there is much more to do. And we are a school district that is very driven by looking at proficiency and learning gain trajectories. 
we deploy additional support to the schools based on precisely these percentages of non-proficiency or not sufficient learning goals. And as we open the school year, you will see an added effort in doing this. One of the uh, items or one of the pieces that's very supportive is all this additional infusion of federal dollars. Be sure that we will continue to use these federal dollars to help us lift the academic learning of our students. We are very focused on doing this, looking at every single grade level and making sure that we are adding interventions, any opportunity, even tutoring beyond the, beyond the uh, school bell, uh, something that we did this year. Yeah. Basically, we had tutoring from five to eight o'clock at night. We wanna bring in tutoring even into Saturday and Sunday. So, and so our teams are doing this yeah. as well so that students have the ability to tap into tutors throughout the entire weekend. We will a not lot stop. going on and a lot of changes yes. going on. Yeah, and so we absolutely will be right there with you watching how this unfolds. And we thank you so much for being with us today. Dr. Dutras, thanks a lot. We appreciate it. Thank you to both of you. Of course. Well, history was made at the U.S. Supreme Court this week when Katanji Brown Jackson was sworn in as a new ju associate justice. That was a landmark moment during unprecedented times. Some perspective is next. I, Ketanji Brown Jackson. I, Ketanji Brown Jackson. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will administer justice. That I will administer justice. To all of the members of the court, I am pleased to welcome Justice Jackson to the court and to our common calling. And with that, Supreme Court Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson takes her place in American history with a South Florida story. The nation's first black woman justice grew up in Miami, graduated from Palmetto High School. She now takes a seat on a court that just issued some of the most controversial, uh, controversial rulings of our times. And whatever she does and decides now is going to get special scrutiny. For some perspective on that, we turn to L'Oreal R. Scott, who is pre past president of the Wilkie Ferguson Junior Bar Association and also chair of Miami-Dade County's Independent Civilian Panel, which reviews complaints against Miami-Dade police officers. L'Oreal, great to have you aboard today. Good morning, Linda. Thank you for having me back. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, L'Oreal. We are glad you are back. All right, so Justice Katanji Brown Jackson Associate Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, did you ever think that you would see that moment? You know, that's such a loaded question. In my lifetime, I don't know if I ever imagined that I would see someone who looks like me on the Supreme Court. Of course, we hope for it, we wish for it, and I believe I probably feel the exact same way as many of my ancestors felt when they watched uh, Barack Obama being sworn in as president. This is such a moment in history that is unimaginable and so surreal. You know what, I just um, was watching the open, watching the replay of the swearing in and something just struck me that I really would love you to weigh in on. Uh, members of the court, I am pleased to welcome Justice Jackson to the Supreme Court and to our common calling. Mm. Does the United States have a common calling these days? Of course we do, Glenna. You know, what's very unique about the United States is we've embarked on this experiment called democracy. And whether we like it or not, the common thread is that we are all free individuals who are able to voice our likes and dislikes about our government, about the topics of the day. And that is what makes us unique as a nation. No other nation has the freedoms that we do as the United States. So what's common to most Americans is our love for this nation, our ability to speak our mind, to take stands on the issues, and to advocate for our cause. Now, we need to be more common in how we agree to disagree, uh, but we still have that common thread of sharing this great experiment in freedom and democracy. Yeah. L'Oreal, obviously, as you have, uh, Katanji Brown-Jackson has broken many ceilings, glass ceilings, 
uh, in her career. After she was sworn in, according to a New York Times story, she was asked if she was ready, and she paraphrased, paraphrased this line from Maya Angelou's wonderful poem, Still I Rise. She said, I do so now while bringing the gifts of my ancestors that they gave. I am the dream and the hope of the slave. Oh, how moving is that? I'm getting chills just having you uh, read that back to me. And it is the weight of every African-American woman, every black woman, every black male. We do bring to our current roles, the dreams and the ancestors, the hopes of the slaves. We are just that. Again, for it to be in 2022, and we have our first black female Supreme Court justice, let's put this in proper perspective. The court has turned 233 years old. Justice Jackson is the 116th Supreme Court Justice. That's but for the grace of God, and that's but for the turmoil that our ancestors went through to get us here today, that she's able to sit in the seat that she'll be holding, and for her to break all the barriers that she made. We really do uh, stand on the shoulders of giants, and we are walking in the path of those who came before us, and we're ever humble and ever grateful for those experiences. L'Oreal, I'd like to, from your perspective, I'd like to hear, and I would like our viewers to hear, the, the new justice comes with very specific life and professional experience to this moment. Uh, she has a defense attorney background, largely. You sit as the chair of the independent review panel of the county. Um, and so there, there's sort of like a common theme and thread there. Talk about what that perspective mm -hmm. and, and the new justice's life and professional experience brings to that collective of nine at this moment? Well, her experience is definitely unique. You know, the judges are people. They bring to the bench their life experiences. So her taking the bench as a black female is definitely an experience that is clearly unique to the bench at this time. Um, thankfully, she's breaking that mold, but clearly she is one of three um, other black men, or excuse me, other black people who sat on the bench. There's where Marshall came before her, and of course, we know Clarence Thomas. But her specific background as the public defender is unique because it would allow her to have a holistic view of every case that comes before her. She'll have the ability to identify with the common folks, the ability to identify with indigent people. And not to say that other justices don't uh, have that experience or have that ability, but what Justice Jackson brings is ground root experience of being in the trenches with the most common folks in our community. So that experience in and of itself is valuable in how she'll view the cases. You know, there's a misconception that because she's a black woman that she comes with a certain mindset. I think what folks uh, misunderstand, and unfortunately I've, I've had that experience too as the chair of the ICP, uh, Independent Civilian Panel. What folks don't understand is that, you know, black women are uniquely versed to understand all aspects of every argument. We live all lives. We are black, we are women in this society, and we know how to maneuver in every, every realm that you can put us in. So we have a bird's eye view of every situation, and I know Justice Jackson will definitely yeah. bring that to the bench with her. L'Oreal, R. Scott, so great to have you back on our show, and thanks for your insightful uh, uh, perspective on our new Associate Justice. Thanks so much. Always a pleasure. Thank you guys for having me. Okay. Thanks. And we we'll will be, be right back. Right back, like he said. <laughs> To re-watch today's interviews or listen to the This Week in South Florida podcast, all you have to do is grab your phone, scan this QR code right there on the screen, and it'll take you right to the This Week in South Florida section of Local10.com. And as always, we thank you so much for being with us here. We are online. Remember, 24-7. Have a beautiful 4th of July weekend holiday.